All right, so we have with us Dr. Pedro Fontes from University of Georgia, and he will speak on reproduction in heifers. And we have Dr. Ralph Noble from Fort Valley State University, who will talk about sire selection. All right, um, good evening, everyone. Um, as um, Dr. Rickley was saying, my name is Pedro Fontes. I'm here with Extension, uh, uh, the Animal and Dairy Science Department with the University of Georgia here in Athens. And most of the work that I do is with beef cattle reproduction. So for our conversation today, uh, following up in the other conversation uh, and the other talks that you guys had over the last few weeks on replacement heifers, I'm going to be covering more on the reproduction side of things. Over the last over the next 20 to 25 minutes, the way that I somewhat organized my presentation was to first revisit some of the things that I was watching Dr. Lee Jones' presentation, and he briefly talked about it, uh, about the importance of getting replacement heifers pregnant early in their first breeding season. And then after I go over some of the projects that highlighted that and, and, and talk a little bit about the importance of this, I'm going to transition into some of the reproductive technologies that we uh, as beef cattle producers can take advantage of, but mostly focusing on the replacement heifers side of things. When I'm talking about um, reproductive technologies here, I'm talking about using those technologies to improve replacement heifers reproductive efficiency, but not only reproductive efficiency, also how we can take advantage of these technologies from a um, herd genetic standpoint and, and from a genetic improvement standpoint. Okay, so um, as we think about the importance of, of getting heifers pregnant early in their first breeding season, I'd like to bring back some of the things that uh, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Lawton Stewart talked about in his presentation. He really did a good job laying out the importance of heifer longevity, right? So as we think about uh, breeding strategies for replacement heifers or just overall replacement heifer uh, development strategies, one of the things that we gotta keep in mind is that it takes those heifers within our beef production system in a commercial cow-calf herd, at least around four years to pay for herd development costs, right? So if you're thinking about breeding strategies, longevity is something that is really paramount when we're talking about replacement heifers. Because again, uh, after we put together all those um, replacement heifer costs into those females, they need to stay in the herd for at least four years in order to, uh, to generate some true return of investment uh, based on that um, heifer development cost. So, uh, and there are some opportunities for us from a reproductive management standpoint to manipulate heifer longevity. And that's what I wanna show you now with a series of studies that um, were done over the last 20 years that really highlighted the relationship between uh, getting replacement heifers pregnant early in the breeding season and their overall lifetime productivity, okay? So um, this is a study that uh, Dr. Lee Jones briefly talked about uh, out of Dr. Bob Cushman's group in Nebraska. They were asking the question, right? How important it is for replacement heifers uh, to become pregnant early in their first breeding season? So basically what they did here, uh, they evaluated cow lifelong productive records uh, based on when those cows calve for the first time as replacement heifers, right? So if you think about what drives the timing of when those um, heifers are gonna calve, it's right? So basically they went back and, 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 and divided the, those cows and, and those performance records that they have Again, based on when they care for the first time as a replacement heifer. So they had three different groups here, and I have them highlighted as period one, period two, and period three. So uh, the cows that were classified as period one were the cows that whenever they were replacement heifers, they care for the first time during the first 21 days of their first calving season. Okay, then the heifers that they uh, classified as period two were the heifers that calved in that second 21 day period interval. Okay, so calved a little bit later than period one. And then period three were the cows that calved towards the tail end of the calving season. Okay, so those are the cows that whenever they're replacement heifers, uh, they became pregnant just in their first breeding season, a little bit later in the breeding season. So they calved a little bit later in the calving season. Okay, so here we have for the three different groups that we talked about, 
We have the effect of the calving date, so the different groups represent different calving dates, on lifelong female productivity, but here we're focusing on fertility, okay? So on the y-axis, we have the final pregnancy rates at the end of the breeding season, and then on the x-axis, we have the different breeding seasons, okay? So if you look at the maroon bars here, uh, these bars represent those heifers that uh, are the kind of heifers that we want. So the, the heifers that were cycling, you know, in the beginning of the breeding season, they became pregnant in the beginning of the breeding season. And they consequently calved in the beginning of their first calving season, okay? So if you look at trust, the different breeding seasons here, those heifers, those cows, that whenever they were heifers, they bred early and they calve early, on average had greater pregnancy rates on their second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth breeding season, okay? So in other words, those replacement heifers that are breeding early and calving early, they are also uh, more likely to rebreed in the subsequent breeding seasons. And overall, on average, they have better pregnancy rates during their productive life. And what's interesting is uh, here, this figure kind of shows the same thing, right? So because those heifers are able to, uh, those cows are able to breed back uh, when they become pregnant early, we ultimately see an increase uh, on the percentage of heifers that stay in the herd over time, right? Because if we're culling the majority of our females based on reproductive failure, the ones that are able to breed well, they end up staying longer in the herd, right? So, and we see those cows that whenever they were heifers, they bred early and they calve early, you can see that a greater proportion of them stayed in the herd, okay? And then when you look at this figure here on the right, this is basically the average age in which those cows were first diagnosed as open, okay? Based on when they became pregnant and consequently calved as a replacement heifer. So you can see that the cows, um, that whenever they were heifers, they bred early and they calve early, they took them on average one year longer to be diagnosed as, pre, uh, as open for the first time, okay? So that translates a little bit of that uh, difference in longevity that I'm pointing out here. So basically those uh, heifers that breed early and calve early, they stay longer in the herd. And actually they on average stay at least a year longer in the herd, okay? So if you think about that from a production setting, on average, those heifers that are breeding early as replacements, they're producing one more calf just based on the fact that they stay longer in the herd, okay? So you're probably asking yourself, well, what's happening to those replacement heifers that breed early? Why are they breeding back better, right? So, and the, the rationale for that is probably associated with what we call the postpartum anesters. And this is really important for replacement heifers because as we think about getting those heifers pregnant, right? We gotta also think about those heifers, when they put a calf on the ground, when, once they calf and they have a, a calf nursing on their side, we need to be able to make those, to get those heifers bred back, right? And one of the things that happen in those uh, young heifers when they give birth to their first calf is that they have a prolonged anastrous period, okay? Mature cows also have that anastrous period, but that anastrous period is more severe in those young heifers. So it takes longer for those heifers to start cycling before, uh, um, after they give birth to their first calf. So this is a situation here where you have a heifer that let's assume you were running a breeding season here starting in April, going all the way until beginning of June, let's say about 60, 70 days breeding season. Let's assume we're, we're in a situation that we have a heifer that bred right in the beginning of that breeding season, right? That's what we want. We want a heifer that, you know, as soon as we turn bulls in or whether we're doing artificial insemination, they breed early in their first breeding season. To think that that heifer is going to have about 280, 285 days uh, gestation length, okay? She's going to calve, if she bred here in the beginning of April, she's going to calve towards uh, the beginning of January, right, of the subsequent year. If you go there and put a 70-day anastrous period when that heifer is recovering from parturition and hasn't started cycling yet, okay? By the time we're turning bulls back in with these replacement heifers, again, now they're nursing a calf, right? Or we're turning a bull in. If that heifer was pregnant early in that breeding season, she, by the time we're turning that bull back in, here in April in the next year, well, that heifer already started cycling again, right? So whenever we turn that bull in, that heifer, that heifer is able to go there and breed right back. Whereas if you get a heifer that um, 
as a replacement, became pregnant towards the tail end of their first breeding season. Well, if you assume that their gestation length is going to be the same, she's going to calve towards the tail end of their first calving season, right? So regardless of when she's calving here, she's going to undergo that postpartum anastrosis. So for a certain period of time, about 60 to 80 days, she's not going to be cycling. She's not going to be having regular cycles. So if we're starting our breeding season here in April, well, guess what? Whenever we turn our bulls in, that heifer is not cycling. She's not expressing asterisk. So that bull is not able to go there and actually get that heifer pregnant, right? So you can see that that heifer is only going to start cycling towards the tail end of their first breeding season or their second breeding season. So it's less likely that they're going to become pregnant. So whenever we go back and we look at the longevity data, it makes sense that those replacement heifers that breed early stay longer in the herd because they have more time to recover between, before the next breeding season. So consequently, they'll breed better too, right? But what's interesting is that, that they not only breed better, but they actually wean heavier calves, which also makes sense, right? So if you think about those heifers, they're calving early, by the time they calve, between the time they calve and the time we're actually pulling calves out of our cows, you know, and the time we're weaning, on average, those calves are gonna be 20, sometimes 40 days older, then the calves they're born out of the heifers they calve towards the tail end of the calving season, right? Simply due to the fact that those calves are older, they tend to be heifer as well. And in this study, again, this is that same study when they divided the, the, the cow performance based on when they bred as replacement heifers. You can see that the solid bar here represents the heifers that bred early and calve early. You can see that during uh, their first six calves that they put on the ground that they actually successfully weaned, on average significantly heavier, okay? And what's interesting is because they're older and heavier at the time of weaning, if we go there and sum those differences in weaning weights between the heifers that breed early versus the heifers that bred later, we actually get almost about a 500 pound difference during their productive life. So if we go back and think about those replacement heifers that bred early and calve early, so they had greater pregnancy rates and greater longevity, right? So I showed you some data showing that they were on average staying the low, uh, in the herd for at least a year longer, right? So they're able to wean an extra calf. But not only that, out of the calves that they wean, those calves are heavier because they're born early in the season, okay? And if you look at those differences throughout their productive life, they actually wean a second calf, right? Theoretically, from a pounds of calf wean standpoint. So there's some clear differences in, in, in productivity between those heifers that breed early and calve early versus the ones that calve towards the tail end. So from a management standpoint, the way that I see this is that there are opportunities for us to um, actively manage reproduction on those heifers to get them pregnant early in the season. Okay, and I'm going to show you some of these opportunities, mostly focusing on the use of synchronization and artificial insemination. Okay, so how can we take advantage of these reproductive technologies to first include superior genetics in our herds through the use of artificial insemination and superior genetics, right? But not only that, how we can strategically use estrogen synchronization to get more replacement heifers pregnant early in the season. I'm going to show you some examples here. Okay. So as we think about the benefits of artificial insemination, well, by utilizing artificial insemination, we can uh, introduce superior genetics more rapidly, right? We know that whenever we go there and we go through a, a, a semen catalog, uh, there's a widespread uh, variety of bulls available for us to select from. And what's really beneficial about those, uh, that widespread um, availability of semen from different bulls, actually some of the best bulls in the country, right? You can buy a, 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 some of the best genetics and introduce in your herd for, for about $20 a head. Between $20 and $30 a head, you can buy bulls that are top uh, 10, 5% for most of the production traits that we're looking for. So, but not only that, those bulls, because they have been used in hundreds of thousands of cows, um, and there's a lot of performance records out there from those AI bulls, okay? Those bulls, they have really high accuracy when we think about uh, the EPDs or, or the genetic, our estimates of genetic merit of that bull, right? So we really know what we're getting from a genetic standpoint. Whereas when we compare to a bull that we buy locally uh, in a sale that we're utilizing a cleanup, as a cleanup bull, 
you know, you can get some pretty good cleaner bowls here in Georgia, but as we compare with those really high quality uh, AI sires, you know, those sires, they're in the AI says they are often superior, if not always superior, right? So AI really gives us the opportunity of, take adv of taking advantage of that. And, and because over the course of the years, the cost of insemination has, has gone down, right? Um, we can actually, you know, in some situations, save money by utilizing artificial insemination. And, and I'm not going to go too much into the economics here today because uh, of a time constraint. But we know we work with some producers that they're actually saving money by utilizing AI. And one of the reasons for that is because they can reduce their bull power. Okay, so let's assume if you're running two bulls with your cow herd and you start utilizing AI, you usually are able to decrease uh, the need for cleanup bulls by half, right? Because we can get about half of our cows pregnant to AI in the beginning of the breeding season. So those bulls are left with less cows to work with. Um, so we can decrease our sire related costs. But not only that, you know, because of the really uh, well controlled um, semen quality and biosecurity that those bulls that are utilizing AI go through. Um, through the use of artificial insemination, we can really decrease disease transmission. Uh, and, and Dr. Jones kind of touched a little bit about some vaccination protocols and things like that. But from a male standpoint, we know the bulls transmit some important diseases that, 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 that has a, uh, have really a somewhat of a high prevalence here in the Southeast. So we can somewhat overcome that by utilizing artificial insemination. So for many years, artificial insemination was really challenging the beef industry. And one of the reasons for that is because we needed to know when cows are ready to, to, to be inseminated. And we used to do that by doing what we call heat detection, right? And, you know, there's a variety of challenges associated with heat detection from an accuracy of heat detection standpoint, but not only that, from a labor standpoint, right? For those of you that have been involved in, in, in AI programs before the development of synchronization protocols, you've probably done a lot of heat detection. And you know how it works. But basically, for those of you that haven't, uh, back in the day, we used to go there and check cows in the morning, about 30 minutes in the morning, 32 minutes to an hour in the morning. And then we'll go back and check cows for heat or heifers for heat in the afternoon, late in the evening, for about 30 minutes to an hour as well. And we will breed heifers or cows based on what we call an AMPM rule. And basically what that means is that we have a cow, if we have a cow in heat or a heifer in heat early in the morning, we'll breed that heifer in the afternoon, okay? If that heifer is in heat in the afternoon, we'll breed that heifer in the next day in the morning, right? So whenever you hear some folks referring to the AM, PM rule, this is what we're talking about. But what's interesting is over the last 20 years, uh, we, we were able to develop um, synchronization programs for the industry, right? So there are synchronization programs out there where basically we're utilizing exogenous hormones to regulate the cycle of a cow, okay? And induce those cows to ovulate in a convenient manner, in a synchronized manner, right? And by doing so, we can eliminate heat detection, okay? So when we're utilizing estrogen synchronization protocols, we can have cows ovulating in a timed manner. And by doing that, we can eliminate the heat detection portion of an AI program and actually go there and perform AI in what we call a fixed time, okay? But not only that, one of the main benefits of this uh, synchronization protocols is that we are able to induce cyclicity in heifers that are not cycling. So we know that a certain percentage of our heifers are not cycling at the beginning of the, pro, uh, of the breeding season. So if we're able to induce cyclicity in those heifers with these synchronization programs, we're able to ultimately increase the proportion of females that get exposed to AI, okay? But not only that, we get uh, more females pregnant in a shorter period of time, okay? So when you utilize AI, we can actually get about 60%, 50% of our replacement heifers bred in the first day of the breeding season. Whereas for, for a cleaner boot, you get that work done, it will take him probably about 40, maybe sometimes 50 days, you get 50% um, um, of those heifers pregnant. So we can really shift that calving distribution. And I'm gonna show you some data to support that. So for those of you that have never heard about synchronization programs, basically in those synchronization programs, we're gonna be utilizing a combination of, of, of uh, uh, synchronization protocols. We're gonna be utilizing a combination of three different hormones. So we're gonna be using prostaglandin, GnRH, and progesterone. And basically the way that these synchronization programs here have the most common program, which is called the seven-day co-sync program, okay? And basically the way this program works, uh, you run heifers through the chute, 
you put a progesterone device, okay, this is an intravaginal device going to the vagina. You give a GnRH injection. So again, GnRH is another hormone uh, that we give to start synchronization of a follicular wave. And then seven days later, what we do, we run those heifers through again. We pull that intravaginal device out, that seizure device out, and we give injection of prostaglandin, okay? And then in a time schedule, we go there 54 hours later when you run those heifers through and we do what we call a fixed time insemination. Because through the use of these hormonal protocols, we're able to actually synchronize when they're gonna ovulate. So we know that if we come here 44, uh, 54 hours later, we're gonna be somewhat in the optimal window to inseminate those animals in a fixed time. Usually what we do as well, we go there and give a second injection of GnRH. So basically, you can see that through these programs, we run heifers through the shoot three times, and then we can time breed the whole herd. So instead of going there and detecting heifers for two months, morning and afternoon, we just run them through three times, and we can expose all heifers to round of AI. And what's interesting is that we usually think about insemination or artificial insemination from a uh, genetic improvement standpoint. But those synchronization programs, because we get a lot of cows pregnant early in the season, have some overall changes, induce some overall changes in, in, in when those heifers become pregnant. Like I said, getting those heifers pregnant early is really important, right? So by using these programs, we increase the proportion of them that get pregnant early, and it ultimately changes their uh, reproductive efficiency. And I'm going to show you some examples here. So this is a study that they compare um, a situation where you have a controlled breeding season, where you're just breeding uh, cows in a natural service setting versus situation where we, do, where we are actually utilizing synchronization and AI, okay? Followed by natural service. So you go there, synchronize those, ca those cows or heifers. And this study here that I'm showing you right now, it's in cows. But basically you time breed everybody in the first day of the breeding season, and then you turn bulls in um, a few days after you bred those replacement heifers, usually about 10 days later. And then the bulls will breed uh, the replacement heifers that fail to become pregnant to that first AI or cows in this example here. But what's neat is that in this study, uh, what they're able to show, you can see that the maroon bars here or the red bars here are the cows that were exposed to the synchronization and timed AI and the gray bars are the ones that were bred just by natural service. You can see that when we look at that first 21 days, remember those heifers that become pregnant or cows that become pregnant during those first 21 days outperforms the counterpart that become pregnant later. So here we have the different days of the calving season and you can see that by utilizing those synchronization programs, we pretty much can double the number of cows are gonna calve during those first 21 days. They're gonna be the more desirable cows, right? And just by shifting that calving distribution, in this study, they were using sires for AI that have very similar genetics to the ones that were using by natural service. They're able to serve about a 40 pound increase, a 38 pound increase in weaning weight, simply due to the fact that those calves that were born out of AI, they were older at the time of weaning. So they're consequently heavier. So if you go there and plug a dollar value, so if you put a dollar sixty-five, is somewhat current values for uh, feeder calf prices in a, a five hundred pound calf, a steer calf, we're talking about a sixty-two dollar difference, right? And usually just that difference in weaning weights uh, very often already offset the cost of the synchronization program. But I'm I'm going to show you some resources that you can actually go there and calculate uh, the impact of this technology based on your production system, based on your, 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 based on what you got going on in your operation. Um, here are some other examples of synchronization protocols. So I show you that seven days co-sync procedure protocol in a previous example, but keep in mind that there are several different protocols out there for replacement heifers. They're usually divided in short-term protocols and long-term protocols, and there's some minor differences between them, but those can get a little bit complicated. So there's some resources online that actually guide you through the process of selecting a protocol. So uh, if you go to the ujbeef.com website um, and you hit on the tools tab, okay, under the reproduction area, uh, uh, under the reproduction tools, there's a tool called the Ester Sync, which I have highlighted here, which is basically a web page that helps you calculate, uh, plan, and budget uh, the use of uh, Ester Synchronization and AI Pro. So um, if you, you know, go back home now and, and you say, well, you know, I want to consider utilizing AI in my program. If you go there and you open that website, you can enter the information of your herd. So you can enter how many animals you're breeding, what kind of breed of, uh, of heifers or cows you're planning on, on, on breed, 
how many animals do you have in your group, and when do you actually want to start your breeding season. And then after you do that, the, the, the software is going to suggest, the web page is going to suggest some uh, general input costs, okay, based on some market averages. And then after you enter your, your information, what the website is going to tell you is going to recommend a protocol for you, but not only that, it's going to give you a calendar. Okay, it's going to describe exactly how to utilize a synchronization protocol, how many times you need to run animals through the shoot, what kind of hormones do you need to give, and when you need to artificially inseminate. So if you never artificially inseminated an animal before, um, and you can bring an AI technician to actually breed your heifers or cows, uh, by utilizing this synchronization tool, uh, you can pick a protocol and, and, and get that synchronization program started. And, you know, you're probably asking yourself, well, if those synchronization programs have a benefit beyond AI, can I utilize synchronization uh, just to get more heifers pregnant early in the season and not necessarily utilize AI? And, and, and the answer to that is yes, you can. So here's an example of a study where they look at the impacts of estrogen synchronization in a situation where we're actually not artificially inseminating. We're breeding heifers uh, with a natural service. And in this case was a situation that, um, they're mimicking herds that, you know, producers cannot afford to run heifers three times to the shoot. So they did a simplified protocol where basically they ran heifers through and gave one injection of prostaglandin, okay? That injection of prostaglandin is probably going to be under $3, about $2.80 uh, per dose. And what you can see is that when they actually look at the percentage of heifers that got pregnant to AI, uh, to AI, no, sorry, at the end of the breeding season, again, they're not utilizing AI in this study. There were no differences here, but what's neat is that whenever they look at when those heifers were calving, because they were synchronizing them with a prostaglandin shot, they're breeding earlier, even for natural service, okay? So when you look at the sync heifers and you look at the weaning weight of our calves, they're on average weaning almost about 20 pounds more because, again, a greater proportion of them were calving early. So when it comes time to weaning, their, their, their steers and heifers at the time of weaning are heavier because they're older, right? So by changing, tweaking the timing of when those replacement heifers uh, are getting pregnant through a simple synchronization program, like giving a single prostaglandin injection, that, produce, that producer was able to capture, you know, on average about $30 per head. So if you think about, you know, investing a, a, a $3 less than $3 prostaglandin dose. And in this case here, they're bringing in an extra $30. And whenever I was calculating this, I basically look at this difference and I added a $1.65 theta calf price, okay, per pound to come up with those $30. So it, it makes a lot of sense, even in a natural service to consider the use of synchronization, because again, we're able to get more replacement heifers pregnant early. Right, and we set those heifers up for success because if they breed early, they're more likely to breed back. But not only that, they're more likely to wean heavier calves, right? Or at least on average, they do wean heavier calves. So before I, uh, I take too long, I want to uh, just wrap it up with a summary slide. Um, so just to summarize what we talked about here, if we're able to get cows pregnant early in the breeding season, but not only cows, replacement heifers bred early in the uh, in the breeding in their first breeding season we're gonna be influencing their lifetime productivity in our herds, right? We're gonna do that by doing two different things. We're gonna increase longevity of those heifers in the herd, but not only that, we're actually wean heavier calves because those heifers are becoming pregnant early, calving earlier, and weaning heavier calves. But not only that, we can utilize ester synchronization in combination with artificial insemination to actively get more heifers pregnant early, right? So we can time when those heifers are becoming pregnant. We can actively do that, which is pretty amazing, right? From a from a from a herd management standpoint, and by doing that, we can add genetic value to the herd and add value to the replacement heifers in general, right? As those heifers become pregnant through a system like artificial insemination. So with that, I'll wrap it up, um, and I'll turn it over to I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Wheatley. Yes, if you can. Um... Just jot down notes of what questions you have. We'll save them for the end so that um, we can ask all the questions at one time. Dr. Noble, are you ready? Well, good morning, everyone. And just to give you a sense of my approach to this very important area is how we're selecting the bulls for heifers 
somewhat different than we are having bulls that we breed the rest of the cows. Normally in a herd, you would expect to not to be have many heifers in, on the farm. So our, our primary selection has been on cows that can handle big babies. But that's not always the case. Uh, people a lot of times will sacrifice the quality of the care from heifers because they don't want to pull any babies. They don't want no dystocia cases. And that's what I want to try to adjust today is the attempt to try to be sure that every care born on our farm has the ability to produce a, a really high quality care. So this gives you a sense of the importance of the bull on the farm. Uh, the bull is half the genetics, half the composition of every calf on the farm. Uh, a heifer, a female, one single individual, is only half the genetics to a single calf. So you can see where even if you keep replacement heifers, the bull's influence on your farm is not only just the coming calf crop, but he's going to influence the quality of the heifers going forward. And if you consume a bull, a bull to cow ratio is one to 25, one bull for 25 cows for a mature bull. You can see where a bull can influence the performance of 25 calves. Uh, but just talking about that heifer or that cow is only one baby. So the value of the bull should really take a little bit more time to pick one. Because normally when we pick a bull, he's going to be with us probably three to five years. And if you're trying to avoid inbreeding, uh, we try to get rid of maybe after the third calf crop. But the bull requires some time. Uh, people sometimes take selecting the bull to somebody that's got testicles. But he can really pull your farm back. Low quality heifers, a low quality performance of the calf, and really ultimately a low, a low or smaller check. So I would say in some cases, the price of a good bull is the, is the summation of the quality of three cows. You know, it's not one bull for one cow. A bull is too important. Let's spend some time being sure we know what we're doing. Because once we get him, we're really going to be sitting back and watching the work happen. Now, one thing about that 1 to 25 ratio, you're talking about selecting bulls, uh, it can vary with a number of factors. One is age. With some of these bull tests that we've been going to, we've been buying almost long yielding bulls, 12 to 15 months. And so that probably needs to lower that ratio. If you put him in there too young or too early, you're going to strain his size. And that can ultimately, in some cases, influence how well he does in the future. Or the environment could influence If it's real hot outside, if you're breeding cows in June and July and August because of the heat, uh, you probably need to reduce that number, 1 to 20. If you go out west where you have people with 1,000 head of cows at times, uh, the size of the herd could influence that. If you have a herd, if you see what we have on campus, uh, one bull can see pretty good, 25 cow. He can cover them. But if he's got to climb mountains, you know, cook, uh, go around the corner, uh, find cows when the sun goes down, you may again have to reduce that number. So don't increase the number. Reduce the number when the farm size is, is large, when the environment is somewhat extreme. And in some cases, when he's not the best help. He got a lot of flies on him. He's probably thin condition that we'll see in a minute. Uh, those things can help influence the bull's ability to get around, and what you may hear you use the word cover those cows. He's just tired of run down. He won't be able to do it. And also nutrition. So looking at the condition score of these animals, you know, with beef cattle, we get them numbers from one to nine. One, two, and three is considered low condition, thin, a moderate, four, five, and six, and fat, seven, eight, and nine. And one thing about a bull during his breeding season, he can sometimes have his mind so much on, well, that's right now, 90 days of breeding. He's not paying attention to eating real well. And one thing that can happen if he gets too thin, his sperm count will drop. And now his cow's not getting pregnant. You'd be wondering what's wrong with those cows. It'd be that bull you took care of. You put him out to too thin. So sometimes we want to target the bull being, I'm going to call it borderline fat. Six or seven. Now, if he gets to be fat in the heat, he can be, he can be a sluggish breeder. He just won't get up and stay with those cows. He said, I'm tired. I'm going to sit down for a while. If he gets too thin, it's going to influence his ability to replenish the sperm reserve. Remember now, we're talking about breeding 25 cows in really 60 to 90 days. He's got to be getting around. So having them come in the, to the breeding season with enough extra flesh that if he didn't get a good meal every day, he could lose some weight, but not lose the weight where his sperm count would go down. He'd be wondering why he's still breeding his cow three or four months later. His sperm count was down because we didn't take care of him. 
So inadequate condition of the bull can lead to repeated matings. He's, made, he's mating that cow over and over again. Nothing wrong with her. His sperm count is down. When you look next year at your calves hitting the ground, instead of you having a 60 or 90 day breeding season, your calves are dropping four or five months in a, in a, a long time because the cow, because the bull wasn't in good shape. His sperm count is running down. Now I got a long calving season because of the result of a, of a long breeding season. Other way, he should be able to take care of those cows in a relatively, Nikki, I think we're talking about 45 days. If a cow has a cycle of every 21 days, you can see in 60 days, he gets a chance to breed her three times. 90 days, it's four and five times. If she's if the cow was sound and she's not bred, bred by four times, that's probably a sub-fertile cow. And I would be careful keeping the genetics of a cow that takes that long to breed. They should be able to breed as quick as they can if we took care of them now. So good condition score uh, and the best health. They should be able to catch that cow and be breeding early, like Dr. Fonte has talked about earlier. We want these cows to hit the ground early in the season. They're going to be our biggest kids when we bring them all at one time. Otherwise, he's repeat breeding, he's repeat breeding, and there's nothing. it could be nothing wrong with the cow. It could be something wrong with the bull. So let's pay attention to what he's doing and what we're doing for there, okay? I think another thing is we pick bulls, and this is just a little words here, because we do use the word form follows function. We're looking for a bull that's going to breed our cows. You take them and eat, catch her, breed her, and hopefully throw a baby that could bring us some money. And so we look at the bulls that can do that real well. They normally have a certain confirmation of shape. And that's what we use the word form follows function. But we're really looking at the bull to have him pass on in his sperm to his genes, his genotype. Now we can measure genotype, DNA, chromosomes and genes, but that's not likely what we do most of the time. We really look at his phenotype, his external appearance. We may look at his performance records. And the assumption is it will tell us what his genes are like. And that's not always true. That selecting the bulls on his phenotype has its place, but trying to get a sense of his genotype and only use the word EPDs, is what we're looking at now. There's a better way to select these bulls so that we feel comfortable that he will give us what we want. We want a predictably superior bull that would give us expected, anticipated, high-performing care. Not any kind of care, superior care. And another thing as we look at these different traits, it's called heritability estimates. And those traits that are important to us picking cows. It's a certain amount of that trait is influenced by the animal's genes and a certain percent is influenced by the way we take care of them. And so performance, the first line you see here, is an example of genotype, what is genes, and it sets, that sets the limit. Normally speaking, we don't expect that bull to do any better than what his genes say. If them genes would be expressed, it's how we take care of them. His nutrition, his health, his feeding, his environment, all of that is going to make us try to attempt to find out what genes are there. So sometimes in some of these tests, we give him all the it's environment he can get, and we expect the difference in the bulls at these test sales is because of his genes. So these genes right here, the genotype, what we call here to be the estimates. How much of a certain trait of an animal is influenced by his genes? And that is not influenced by genes, it's what we take care of him. And so we call here to be estimates percent of a trait controlled by genes. And so if you look at all the traits we may measure beef animals for, there's traits that we consider lowly heritable, meaning a small percent of, the of his genes is due to genetics. So things like fertility and reproduction, it means that they, they're lowly heritable. When a cow is doing real well, when a bull is throwing multiple births, it's because the, the environment is doing the job. 85% is the environment. Up to 15% is the fertility. So fertility is not a trait we can improve a whole lot of through breeding. It's mostly influenced by the way we take care of them. What another trait we need to be sensitive to is what we call moderate irritability. And those are between 15 to 25%. Traits like birth weight and average daily gain. It says that up to 25% of a, of a baby's birth weight or daily gain is due to genetics. 
which means that we can select for that trait. But that again, up to 75%, it's going to be due to the environment. We can mess up this birth for the average day of the game, but we can make some progress through modern heritability. And then the trait that has the highest heritability, I should put that in more like 60%. Highly heritable traits, things like muslin, frame score, if they have horns or carcass traits, those traits are highly heritable and they can be up to 60% due to genes. What that tells us when I want a good bull, I want to find a bull based on moderate and highly heritable traits. Birth weight, average daily gain, frame score, his muslin, and he will pass it on to his babies. If he's highly fertile, it only means he's going to be highly fertile. It means that all his daughters or offspring will mostly be done by the environment they come from. So I can buy a bull, a cow maybe from somebody who has multiple births, take a moment, don't feed them well, she might even get pregnant. Because more of the influence of that animal's reproductive performance due to the environment and not necessarily the genes. And this is another thing I think we need to be sensitive to is I see farmers putting any kind of bull in there with their cows. And this is going to impact, I'm going to say, your income. Your cows are doing pretty good at certain markets. And some of us are not getting the good money because I think it's not going to hold true for so long. Although I do hear about some trouble in Texas, which are hopefully bring our cow prices up. This is the way it normally goes in general. Not always 100%, but this is way it goes. A bull that's born small, he has a slow growth rate. Slow, low, average daily gain, and low weaning weight. And those animals that are born big, they grow the fastest. But if you don't have big cows, they give you the most distortion problem. The babies that have to be pulled. We do in C sections. And nobody wants to pay for a C section. And so that's the challenge with having it. And so another thing about bulls that grow real fast, we have to be careful with these bulls. They sometimes are lowly fertile and the daughters don't make a lot of milk. That's the trend. So when I want to get a good bull, we're going to call this a herd sign now. That, that's the common traits. This is what I want to look for. And we're going to look at traits that can tell me I'm going to get this. And we're using the word EPDs. We want a bull that's going to come out small. I'm going to say 65 to 75 pounds. But when he gets ready to wean, he's as big as the fellas that were born with a big birth weight. That's a herd sire. There's not a lot of them. You got to go look for them, but they're worth your money. They're born small, but they grow as big as the big boys. What else about it? They grow real fast, but they still got good fertility. His daughters still make a lot of milk. Again, it's not the normal trend, but I want to get a bull that may take a little more looking, a little more evaluation of his background to be sure I can get a bull like this. And that's what we've been trying to look with, with EPDs to help us get some idea of predictability, expectations. What do I want to see in a bull? Don't just get a bull because he's black or he's got a certain color or a certain confirmation. I want to know about his genes and if he's going to do the trade for my herd going forward. And the same thing would go for a bull that's increased muscle and growth and carcass traits. Because them bulls sometimes can be influencing more for the meat market and less for replacement efforts. Another issue I think when we're trying to pick bulls is we need to be concerned about is the incidence of dystocia or difficulty in giving birth. And it could be for a number of reasons. This is the three primary reasons. One is the calf is in the wrong position. Malpresentation, I use the word, where the calf slowly to come out with his front two legs first, his head between his uh, shoulders there, and he delivers with his uh, front feet coming out first. If you get to chasing your cows around before they, I'm going to say the last, I'm going to say the eighth month of pregnancy, ninth month of pregnancy, I, I prefer not to handle those cows no more. Don't be trying to deworm them and throw them around, throw a rope on the head and pull them in the chute. You're going to shake that baby up when it's trying to position itself so they have no trouble. So roughing your cows up during the last month of pregnancy can get this kind of trouble. Nothing wrong with the cow. Those hips are wide enough. Doesn't wrong with the baby's birth weight. The bull looks an adequate size. He just was either twisted, backwards, sideways, something, something happened to get it all wrong. What's another reason for dystocia? The cow's pelvis is too small. We bred it too early. In a rest to get the season, she didn't come off the, the uh, weaning weight large. She didn't grow real fast during the post weaning period. But I'm still going to give her a chance and let the bull breed her anyway. Now the calf can't get out. Now I'm talking about $300 for a C-section and the cow ain't worth for $300. Oh boy, you see which way we're going? 
But what we can do with your next collection is when we have issues with large birth weights. Again, we talked about that being a moderate heritability trait, that when bulls are born big, they throw big babies. When bulls are born small, they tend to have small, they throw small babies themselves. The challenge here, because we know big babies grow fast, we're trying to walk this, this uh, a tight line there. So I'm gonna talk about using EPDs to big bulls who do not throw large birth weight babies. We don't want them. They cause too much trouble. Some cows can handle it, but certainly natural heifers. So these are the ways we select bulls. You can go look at them, visual appraise them. We sometimes look at the shows. They got a lot of blue ribbons, he must be good. We can go to performance tests where the, everything is kept the same. Same environment, same diet, same health. And then we just look at the difference in any bulls there. And we assume that is due to his genetics because everything about his environment is kept the same. So we're actually are paying for information. That's what we're doing. We're paying for information to get a sense of where we're going with that. But I think another thing we need to be looking forward to is to try to be sure about our bulls. Remember I'm saying the price of a bull may be three times the price of a good cow, if not more, that we need to be sure about what we're doing. And one of those areas that I think has become readily available to more of our farmers is the understanding of expected progeny differences. What do we expect this bull's offspring, progeny's offspring, how do they differ from other bulls in the same breed? And these two things are EPDs now. EPDs for birth weight and EPDs for CED or cabin ease direct. Now for heifers, when it's zero, that means that calf is throwing average babies. This is probably the only EPD value that people can look at that we would accept being zero or negative. But a calf can be up to two pounds. You better have some big heifers. Oh, while well, we're thinking one to minus one or plus one is an EPD of a bull that can throw babies that a good grown heifer should be able to handle. The other important trait to look at, in addition to EPDs, is what's called Cavanese direct. These are going to be bulls that have been around long enough. They've already made it, some, a number of cows. They've had their babies on the ground. And they talk about the difference in this bull compared to other bulls that were unassisted by heifers. That cow's not assisted heifers. And the higher that number is, it means that this bull, so for example, 1% Cavanese direct, means he has probably close to average number of Cavanese problems, unassisted problems. But if he's 15% above, the rest of these cows, he's saying that almost nobody has trouble with his babies. So going to find the Cavanese direct emblem, in addition to birth weight when you're breeding heifers, I think are the two most critical things we need to try to understand. Oh, as in bulls that are born big to throw big babies, they're going to be cheap. The, boys that, the ones that's born little, they grow slow, they're going to be cheap. But the ones that could be born that your heifers can handle, and you won't take a step back when you breed it to your cows, that's what we're talking about. But we're talking about heifers here right now. So close to average for that breed. So if that's Angus, 70, Charlay and Simitol, it could be 80 or 90. But this should always tell you the case right here. Cavanese direct, 15% higher rate or lower rate of helping assisting calves. So 1% means that he has average unassisted births. 15% means he has above average uh, unassisted births. Mo most of these cows are not having no trouble coming out of the heifers, okay? And another thing to look at, we're gonna see a, a table in a minute. It has to do with accuracy. Accuracy almost tells you how much confidence gonna have in these values up here. Because one thing about these values, the more babies or more information they have in those numbers, the more comfortable I'm gonna get that, those results. When I'm buying a yearly board of performance sale, that may not be very accurate. It can change a lot. But when some of these bulls, and uh, Dr. Fontes mentioned earlier, they got 30, 40, 50,000 calves on the ground. And if they 30,000 have had slow birth rates, you can probably be a pretty good that that's what it's going to be. So when an animal has, I'm going to say less than 0.25, it's considered low accuracy. It's related to low predictability, and the information is based on not a lot of calves. When the information gets above 70, 80, 90 is really getting out there. That's considered high accuracy. It's related to high predictability and you got information on a lot of calves. So the bulls that's been around a long time, they have high accuracy if they're still around, 
If the performance data went down, you don't keep around doing it any longer than that. So accuracy along with EPDs is going to be something important to follow. So performance tests, you, know, you can see those information where bulls are kept together in the same environment for somewhere between 90 and 120 days. And then we see because we keep the same diet, we keep all those environmental factors, diet, temperature, location, health is all the same. And the assumption is if any bull is superior or behind the rest of them, it must be because of his genes. We're trying to predict genes. So these bulls may cost a little bit more money, but we're paying for information. Oh, well, they can look like peas in a pot. They can look alike, but the genes don't say the same. And the ones that we choose to, the superior here, these are our sires. Okay, let me go to the next one. I think we should always be mindful of taking care of the bulls. Sometimes because we're following, let's say 25 cows on the farm, we put the bull, I'm going to call it the back 40. He's stuck back there somewhere. We're going to look at him every once in a while. But remind you now, he's going to be half the 25 calves. If we mess up with him, don't take care of him. He's going to have a calving season spread out over four or five months. I want him to come in there and breed these cows, 25 cows in 60 days, and go back and sit around doing nothing, really, putting that weight back on for the next 10 months. If I don't take care of him, I don't take care of my cows, I'm leaving them in there for three months, I'm leaving them in there for four months, five months. The cows know better. The genes are not any better. It's the way we take care of them was up to par. So record keeping, you know, know who the bull is, understand his pedigree, I would say, maybe something learned from that. Get a sense over the years to see, especially if a multi sided herd, how my cats are doing from these different bulls. Some bulls I may not keep them all. And if I had to go sell them or get rid of where I want to trade them, he's still good. What is he worth? What did I pay for him going forward? Always get rid of the herd health issues going forward. So be sure you get any vaccinations in place, uh, controlling any diseases that may be prevalent in your community. Brittany will tell you that. Worry about internal parasites, deworm him, and external parasites, flies, lice, and ticks. These will rob the energy of the bull during the key part of the season. But I'm trying to focus on, we're going to say 90 days, 60, 90 days. If this is not taken care of, you'll be wondering why your bull is not doing his job because he's not feeling that great. And then have his, uh, go back, go back, go back. Where'd I go? Okay, so nutrition program. So be sure the diet is balanced, not overly fat. Be sure he got minerals, especially trace minerals. And just like the cows, I would say, when I'm trying to beat them, could we sometimes make our heifers a little bit slimmer a relatively, uh, I call it a borderline fat bull. So conditions go about six to seven. So avoid obese bulls. They tend to be sluggish breeders and thin bulls that get worn out. So reproductive management, you know, we're going to talk about some things here now with a breeding science exam. If you got about the bull, how you take care of him, it can influence his performance. Uh, whenever we buy bulls that's been untested, uh, a new bull for sure, the more we've been investing in him, the more we want to be sure about what we're buying, it's what's called a breeding science exam, BSE. Certainly any new bull, and any bull from year to year, the more cows he's got to breed, the more likely I'm going to be sure he's going to take care of business. But here it means evaluating his physical and overall health, usually done by a veterinarian. We're going to look at his scrotum, the skin that covers the testicles, look at the organs inside of the testicles, and also his scrotal circumference. You know, usually you want to see this 32 centimeters and up, going forward to be considered fertile bull. And that's in bulls that's more than like yearlings. I think Nick of the bull we got on campus, is, I think it's around 39, 38 centimeters. And so these bulls that we expect to have enough sperm reserves to breed them 25 cows we thought about. When the scrotal guard is down in the 20s, the scrotum look like it ain't quite together. It's been kicked or somebody been throwing slingshot rocks at him. He may not be able to breed them 25 cows we talked about. We got to lower that number. But they would take a collection of semen from him and we're going to look at a number of traits, both semen quantity, what's the volume of the ejaculate, five mils, the concentration, we're looking for maybe about one billion per mil, and then the quality of that semen, how well the sperms are moving, motility, and then a live dead percentage in them. So that one billion sperm, we want to see, I'm going to say 60, 70% motile, progressive motility, and 70% live. Uh, anything that's wrong with that, he doesn't make those sperm not look as normal, those kind of issues. And certainly we should do this, get this BSE done prior to purchase. Most of the period bread sales will do this before the bull enters the sale. It's a guarantee for you. Uh, you want to do this sale, have this done for your bull 
I'm gonna say 45, 60 days before the preseason start, not the day before. So if something goes wrong, we know we got time to go correct it. And the one thing these exams do not tell us is his mating behavior. We normally gotta wait till the bull gets out there with the cows to see what he's doing. Some bulls only breed at night. He said, he's not breeding no cow, what's wrong with him? But then nine months later, he got his calves on the ground. He's doing okay. And I think another thing about the trait ratios is a comparison of a trait on the bull. We're talking about heifers here. So when it comes to here, we're only looking at birth weights and weaning weights. I'm sorry, birth weights and uh, uh, CED values. But most of the time, because we want his calves to grow well, we don't want to isolate and have low weaning weight or yielding weight expectations. And so with these ratios, we're going to compare a bull's traits in a farm that you may go to with other bulls in that same environment because they may vary from a bull in South Texas to New York City, New York State. And so finding comparable traits in the same herd is probably the best way to compare that. So this is what we've been looking at for the most part, I would say. Uh, birth weights, as I mentioned before, calving ease direct. But let's not ignore weaning weight data and yielding weight data. Even though we want the cat to be born small, we can find bulls who still grow pretty good, maybe not extremely high when it comes to these growth factors. But what's important to me, because I'm breeding my heifers, is his baby's got to be born small, and, he, and his daughter shouldn't have any trouble delivering them babies. Cabin is direct. But I also want to always consider, what was his weaning weight? And when he came off mom, post weaning weight growth, what do you weigh as a year the weight? Those traits should always still be considered with uh, bulls for heifers. This is what we're looking at with the Georgia Coalition. Uh, weaning weights plus 60 pounds or higher. Even weigh plus 100 pounds. But so far, I think, as I thought the hand in Barry, uh, nobody's pulled any calves yet on these calves. We got about 100 calves on the ground from the group of bulls we bought last year. And nobody's talked about that, looking at those weaning weights, uh, those birth weight EPD values. I think it needs to be sensitive to understanding with traits. If you're looking for bulls that you're going to keep as heifers, maternal traits, and those that we're going to sell all the calves. But sometimes these bulls are built differently, and they traits don't always cross-react with each other. And just to give a sense of some of the traits we see in animals, I mentioned about Angus, black animals, English breeds, Angus herpes short on. They're typically going to be small birth weights. The Angus is pulled. You can get some whole herpes. They consider more fertile. They, they reach maturity faster. Puberty may be the first cycle, nine months. She's ready to go to that bull sometime 12 months. But let's be careful with that. So Angus and blood can expect to have a bull that breeds cows that breed early and that early maturing. Let's keep on traits. The exotic or continental breeds, Simitol, Charlie limousines, you can anticipate seeing large break weights. They grow like the Dickens, so that's real good if you got big cows. If not, you can expect increase in the social concerns. So you do see people crossing these with other breeds. Medium to large frame, heavily muscled, but the, low, the slow maturing trait here, uh, when you're looking at an Angus bull and you're looking at his scrotal circumference at 15 months, a Charlotte or Scimitar may not have it at that time. He may have to wait till he's closer to 18 months to see if his traits are going to be, reflect his slow maturing rates. The same thing with some of the U.S. American breeds because they're hybrids with, with the Brahmin cattle. They have this heat tolerance, disease and parasite resistance, and they do give you hyper vigor when they cross. But then they're not known to have the best carcass traits. And they use the word ear and the people that buy these cattle. But if you have too much ear in the calves, it's going to be a restricted area of the, of the country that will buy your calf, rather than having uh, people that want to buy them in, in the Midwest, where some of the bigger uh, feedlots are. Uh, Brahmin cattle, you know, you don't see those much. You see them in South America and Africa. And we see them in rodeos. Uh, they can handle the heat very well. You do see them. With a, a large amount of hybrid big, when you breed your cows with them, they jump real big. But the buyers don't like them as much because of the hold back in the traits that they have when it comes to carcass traits and growth performance in the cold weather. And when it comes to picking traits on the bulls, I think you just probably look at balanced traits. Don't look at birth weight only. Uh, traits that are not, we're going to say not extreme, but it used when you look, you look at crossing up other breeds together. Angus hurt for the black baldies, a scimitol with Angus. You can't get hyper vigor in there when you may get bigger birth weights than EPD said. So traits and heritability, influence, heritability estimates can tell you how fast you can move that change in your herd. Will I get a significant change next year? 
but it took me three to four years. And it would vary the, the progress of speed. So this is an example of, of a bull's pedigree. So you got this the bull we're talking about at the top, triple A, one, one, nine, three, five, eight, nine, seven. This is his father, the top number. This is his mother. This is his paternal grandsire, paternal grand, um, maternal sire. And the same here. This bull right here, QOS Traveler 234, he's got almost 100,000 babies on the ground. So seeing them in the trade makes you think he those small babies so they grow real fast. But this is what I want to go look at here. This is Cavanese Direct, and right below it, it says accuracy. So Cavanese Direct says he has about a 6% lower rate of assistant births. So unassistant rates, his, a lot of his kids do not come up with assistance. What else to say about accuracy? 88% accuracy. You can bet your money on that. Remember now, I say he's got 100,000 babies on the ground. Maybe not at this time, but that's where he is now. And let's look at birth rates. The birth rate EPD on the production says that his babies, Angus, are only going to be a one pound heavier. That's a small baby. I say small, Angus. So I think you can handle that with an Angus animal. What's even more impressive, his accuracy is 95%. That out of the many babies that he would breed, you can feel pretty sure, certain that you would get a birth rate as close to this. And these things may change as you go along. See, weaning weight plus 40 pounds, yielding weight plus 70 pounds. But this time, look at the accuracy value. 80, 95, 92, that's something worth looking at. I would feel more comfortable because sometimes the semen is real cheap. Are the bulls that's not proven. Proven meaning there's not a lot of babies that have this data. And that'll make a champ of there. So this is, this is it again. Under production, Cavanese Direct was 0.6, which is okay. And it's a pretty good accuracy. And his birth weight is small. For average, for Angus, which is small. And a very high accuracy value in that. These are the things you want to look at when you're looking at EPD value or you're buying bulls, not by sight, but looking at some EPD value. we got to pay for information. So summarizing, I would say, sire selection can have a great impact on the care crop, not only this year, but when you look at your replacement heifers, you're hurt in the future. Select bulls to breed heifers that can be delivered unassisted, CEDs. Selection today can offer information. we got to pay for information. They can improve predictability. We want to feel comfortable that we're going to get our results. Select bulls to breed heifers to get them off to a best start. Because as Dr. Fonte said earlier, when they hit the ground early in the season, they have a longer lifetime production and they tend to give you better cares in the group. So the future of your herd depends on what you select for your cows today. Thank you. All right. Any questions for Dr. Fontes or Dr. Noble? You know, one of the challenges we have when we have I'm gonna call it one bull herds. We got we got one bull to beat all the cows. It's a challenge to find a bull that can throw small babies and breed a, breed the cows too and have a, a winner which you want to have. Oh, why you got to go buy your heifers? That's gonna be your option. Don't try to breed your heifers. But if, or, or some people will let them wait another year. I'm probably not the one to support that the most. Uh, they cost a lot of money when you, you have these animals around the farm for a year. So getting them big enough either on mother or up to breeding uh, weight. It's a problem because once we get them up to breeding size, let them go. If they don't make the size, that's, that's part of the cash flow. Okay, Dr. Fonte is Dr. Noble. This is Paul Copeland. I do have a question here. What's the recommended breeding age for heifers? What, what should we look at on that? Recommended breeding age and or weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a, a, a good rule of thumb is uh, I personally like better the, the, the weight component and the age. Um, usually if you get about 60 to 65 percent of what they will weigh as mature cows, that's a good rule of thumb to know that that heifer is ready to, to, to start a breeding season, okay? And you can use that, let's say you wean a group of heifers and you're trying to plan how much weight they need to gain. You can do a calculation based on that. Okay. When we're talking about 65% of the mature body weight, basically, let's assume your cow herd is on average 1,300 pounds. So you go there and calculate 60 to 65% of that. So when heifers are about that, uh, at that stage of development, that's what you want to shoot for. A few things to keep in mind if you're uh, 
you know, from, for folks here in Georgia, they're in South Georgia, uh, you might be running some Brahman uh, or Brahman influence heifers. Keep in mind that those heifers are a little bit later maturing, right? So our Angus heifers, once they reach about 13 months of age, it's a good age to breed them, right? between 13 to 16 months of age, 15 months of age. But if you have some heavy Brahman influence heifers, um, more than 60%, um, let's say more than 50% um, Brahman or 50% or more Brahman, even less than that, like about 40% Brahman, you can start seeing a little bit of, the delay, of a delay in puberty achievement, okay? And that's normal. Um, uh, there are some things that you can do from a genetic selection uh, to try to tackle that. Um, you know, there are some lines within the Brahman breed that they'll breed early. Um, but it's a, there, there's an added layer of challenge there. So what a lot of people that are running Brahman, uh, heavy Brahman influence cattle are doing, they're waiting till those heifers reach 24 months of age. Then that's when they do their first breeding season. That's an option too. But keep in mind, you know, think about the cost of developing that heifer all the way until she's 24 months of age. And then you're going to get her pregnant there. Then she's going to calve nine months after that. So she's going to be more than 30 months. And then you add another seven months there. She's going to wean the calf. She's going to, you're going to be feeding that, that heifer for about, you know, uh, more than three years before she actually gives a, give you a calf back. So these are all things you keep in mind um, as you think about when you want to do it. And, and Dr. Punches, I agree with you 100%. And I think that's the challenge when we have herds that are mixed breeds. When breeds have Charlie in them, a Simitol limousine in them with the Brahma cattle, they're going to be a little bit slower maturing. So when you look at scrotal circumference, when you do pelvic exams of the heifers, it's going to have to be pushed back compared to Angus and Herefords. You know, Angus, if I'm, going to, I'm going to separate the word puberty versus sexual maturity. And so if I'm talking about humans, a girl that's 12 years old may have her first cycle, but we don't expect her to have her child until she's probably 18 years of age. So I call 12 years old in a human puberty and more 18 years is close to sexual maturity. So I'm thinking about breeding the heifers when they can handle that cow, that calf, they can deliver it without you helping out. She got enough milk to make it. And then they're a little small cup, cup of milk for udder, but I want a gallon of milk in that udder. And so being sure she's adequate size, breeding them too early, you sometimes stun her. You sometimes get a small udder, she don't milk out right, but her genes are good. You just mismanaged her a little bit. So you got to get a sense of what's in your herd when it comes to the breed influence. When they got Angus in it, or if my cow's taking too long to breed, I put Angus bull in there. They will reduce the early age and when they reproduce. Okay, so that's going to be your help. Uh, he mentioned the 65, 70%. If you don't have a bull that got good babies, good size, the challenge at the farm, uh, handy for sure, is to get them off that cow heavy enough that they can keep the weight gain post-puberty so that when the breed season come back around and say April for us, she has the size to be more like 75%. We can, we'll, we'll take a chance with 65%, but let's try to cheat, seek for 70%. If I got 1,100 pound cows, I got 1,300 pound cows, you see them big Brahma cattle, beef master cows out there I've been seeing, you got to get that break, you got to get that, that body weight probably closer to a thousand pounds. I see Angus maybe maybe 850. So the, you, you, you want to look at age. That's the, the body's reproductive system is in place, but a physical shape needs to also be there. So small maturing breeds, Angus and Herefords, uh, you know, people can take chances smaller, but 850 pounds, I think, when they get to be Charlotte's and Brahma, they probably may have to be more like a thousand pounds at the same age. That's going to be a challenge trying to get those heifers bred and trying to give a, a recommendation. Dr. Pontes and I cannot give recommendation if you don't know your breed composition, you don't know the, the status of your cow, the age. Because sometimes we have, I'm going to call it a finish line. I'm going to put my bulls in in April. I want that bull, that cow ready in April. Well, you need to go calculate how much weight you got put on. You know, be sure the age is going to be there and make a plan to be successful. Don't just hope and stick her in there and take a chance. Let's plan when she gets weaned and I'm going to sell her. I'm going to take a chance with her being ready to breed by the time the breed season starts around. I got piss and feed her in some cases. Or in your case, Paul, you got pretty good pasture. Continue that on and make sure things continue to grow in the same way. Don't let it bump. Thank you.
All right, I'm gonna ask the question, Dr. Noble, um, just to create a little bit of discussion. So um, EPDs are breed specific, right? So how can we, if we have an Angus-based herd or an Angus-type herd, even if they're not purebred, but they're, they're Angus size, Angus type, how can we, if we want to crossbreed, how can we use or can we still use EPDs for different breeds? With yeah, I'm probably not as comfortable. Yeah, I've seen some beef magazine articles and journals, even in animal science, where they've used mixed breed EPDs. I'm probably more comfortable with the ones within the breeds. So when your cows is mixed up, you just got to make an educated guess to see where you're going to fit into that. I think it's going to be a mixture of the two. You know, when you don't see Brahmin, say Brangus, you got Brahmin and Angus in it, you look at the uh, Simbras, you got Brahmin and Simitol, you know, those breeds are going to give you a sense of understanding where those EPDs should fit with the bull or the cow should be or the expected offspring of the baby. So when you look at things like hybrid vigor. Because hyper big, it can throw a wrench in what we're saying about EPDs. Mr. Pontius, what do you think? Yeah, and, and another thing about thinking about, uh, as you think about, you know, if you're trying to do some crossbreeding, um, there's the hybrid vigor, vigor component. But if you're if you're trying to um, do the comparison across, let's say you're trying to decide whether you, you have an option of a Charolais bull and an option of an Angus bull, uh, the BIF, so the Beef Improvement Federation, uh, they throw some, um, we call them adjustment factors that you can adjust the EPD for comparisons. So basically they use that as a, they use the Angus breed as a, as a, as a standard. So if you have a Charolais bull, you gotta go there and, and for each different EPD, they calculate an adjustment factor. So you use that adjustment factor to compare the Charlie bull to the Angus bull. So you can do a, a crossbreed comparisons of EPDs only that way. For crossbreed comparisons, you, I can, I'll pull it up the link here. I'll send it in the chat box. And yeah, that's probably that's... another good way to look at it is there's adjustment factors with the Angus accepted across the system. I think there's probably 60 breeds of bull, breed, beef cattle in America. We probably use most of the times about 10 of them. And so they use Angus as the base and convey everybody to that. Any other questions? Uh, well, no, Dean, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted, for me personally, um, um, HK Farm and HKJ Ranch, um, by implementing the EPD data that you have been going over for the last two years, I can definitely see a big difference in my um, performance of my calf this year. So um, just by um, being able to use those EPD to help select the bulls that we purchase, um, just a 180 degree difference in my, my calf performance so far. And so I'm really looking forward to be able to, to be my first year really uh, heifer replacement, trying to select the heifers. And now with the uh, reinforcement of um, on Dr. Fontos basically stating that you know, record keeping and making sure those um, heifers are basically getting pregnant, you know, as soon as possible, how that's going to really influence my profit margin. So that's what it all boiled down to me is that my calves are born small. I didn't have to pull in it. Um, they are larger size uh, within the same amount of time. Um, they look good doing the vaccination, the herd management. So I I know I'm going to see a, a 10 to 15 percent um, change in my profit margin this year from what I was seeing last year in my cow, in my cow herd. So, but I'm just really looking forward to and, and selecting some uh, replacement heifers and just seeing um, and making sure that they are like, actually born early and I, um, are getting pregnant early in the breeding season. So I see good things happening at my farm and my ranch um, in the near future. So looking forward to, and thank y'all for the information. It's um, been a, uh, a good journey so far. I'm seeing positive results on the farm. So um, thank y'all. Yeah. Mr. McCance, are you on board? I think he's been selecting animals with EPD values for some time. Uh, I have a couple of, I guess, three or four years now. And uh, I do pay attention to <clears throat> to certain certain EPDs that I feel have been important to me. I try to, basically, I, I, I go to moderate. I, I think, and as you and I discussed a few days ago, I think I leaned, I may have leaned a little 
a little too heavy on on low birth weight aspect, but I do consider I do consider uh, 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 yield. I mean, uh, wean weight, yield weight, uh, marbling, uh, milk select, uh, milk, and uh, that those are the major areas that I consider. And I, I, I think it make in my case, and anyway, it, it made some difference over over the years. Um, I've got some challenges with it still, but uh, I think that I think the uh, trend is positive. And EPDs is a major consideration when I look at a bull. Of course, I want to see it too. I want to see the bull, but but as I was telling someone in the past, when I see it, I really don't know what I'm looking at until I look at those EPDs and compare it to and compare it with what I see visually on the bull. So you know, it can be pretty, but if the EPDs don't don't uh, measure up, I'm not going to mess with it. I think another thing I think I slipped past when I showed pictures of those bulls. The Angus bull in that picture is what they call smooth. If you look at his shoulders to his ribs, it should almost feel like it's a bottle going straight down his line. If you look at that Charlet, his shoulders and his hips bulge out. And that can give a couch. And it, with the weight is one thing, but the way an animal is put together is an also a factor when certain cows have trouble delivering the babies. You see them get hip locked. You know, Charlets and limousines have big hips on them. You see those in there. Uh, Herfits, other breeds you may see with big heads. And so the way they're built, so the blending of the shoulders into the rib cage is another confirmation trait to look at. You don't want them to look like he's an MMA wrestler, you know, unless you get some real big cows. If they can look like once they, it's almost like trying to catch them in the head gate. Once the shoulders get in there, the rest of that body goes straight through. That's a straight animal. It should not dip behind the shoulders or dip in front of the hips. So smooth from the shoulders to the rib cage to the hip, that's the kind of calf when that bull throws it on his babies. They're the ones that's easier to deliver. So confirmation is what we're seeing here, in addition to EPDs. Any other questions? All right, if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank both of our speakers for coming and remind everybody that our, our next and last presentation dealing with heifer development will be next Monday. So we're not skipping a Monday this time. Um, it'll be next Monday, the 15th, and I look forward to seeing everybody there.